Hampshire Archaeological Society 2021 Archaeology Month's presentations. My name is Linda Furderer, President of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society. Tonight I would like to welcome Hannah Dutton, Teaching Lecturer at Plymouth State University. Hannah has been working in archaeology and collections management since she started as an anthropology undergraduate student at Plymouth State University in 2013. She received her master's in anthropology at New Mexico State University in 2019, where her thesis was based around a legacy collection at the university. She has worked in many archeological settings, including cultural resource management, museum education, teaching college classes, as a digital curation technician with the digital archeological record, and working as a field laboratory manager at Enfield Shaker Museum. Hannah has worked on collections from as close as New Hampshire and as far away as New Mexico, New York, and Nicaragua. Welcome, Hannah. Thanks, Linda. Uh, should I start sharing my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So I also, hi, everyone. Uh, I don't know why I'm nervous today. I teach on Zoom regularly, but for some reason, I'm nervous tonight. Um, I want to start today with an Indigenous land acknowledgement. Um, I want to acknowledge that this presentation, as I'm at Plymouth, I'm in the Plymouth Archaeology Lab, that this uh, presentation takes place on Indakina or and the um, Indigenous ancestral lands, the unceded ancestral territory of the Abenaki, Penacook, and the Wabanaki peoples, as well as in New Mexico, uh, my research took place on unceded traditional homelands of the Mescalero, Apache, and Pueblo peoples. Um, legacy collections and archaeology in general have a lot to do with collections from these peoples, um, and many times we handle materials that have been um, stolen or looted from uh, these unceded territories and are locked behind, you know, locked in closets and in storage rooms from the people who they belong with and belong to as well. Uh, so thank you for being here today. Um, my presentation, I'm also gonna keep a little bit of eye on the chat. Um, as I do this, I'm gonna try and multitask. Um, my talk today is on legacy collections, a really uh, huge passion of mine. Um, I've done, you know, excavations, I'm an archaeologist, but I really, really love legacy collections. Um, also called orphan collections, uh, but, you know, legacy collections are far less uh, uh, sad to call them that. So the SAA, uh, the Society for American Archaeology, in their uh, guidelines for uh, preparing legacy collections, Define legacy collections as collections made during one career, one's career, uh, for which no museum or repository was formally designated. So projects that people have completed with when they were excavating materials, um, no kind of uh, museum or uh, repository like Plymouth was designated at the start. Alternatively, they may be large collections of objects and associated records, which for a variety of reasons were not submitted to a repository. Some of these collections have not been completely cataloged. Uh, they were excavated, uh, stored, and then the lab work was never finished. Um, these collections can, but not always, include the material objects, the artifacts themselves, also site photos, site maps, photos, uh, any detritus that is found in an archaeological collection in any number of different formats. I've seen the gamut um, of legacy collections in different uh, states of disrepair, disuse, uh, forgetfulness. Um, these are the kinds of collections. Um, they can also be donated and given to a repository or a museum, someone from a private collection, uh, from, a, from a historic household, um, digs up artifacts, they don't really know what to do with them, you know, broken glass, things like that, donate them to a museum repository. Um, so we don't have the provenience, right? We don't necessarily know the exact location in the ground where those artifacts came from. Um, but also these are, these are the projects that I've heard this a thousand times that um, archeologists are notorious for excavating a lot of material 
And at the end of the excavation, they get to write their report, but not all the, all, not all the lab work is quite completed and archeology span is really busy. Mm. They move on to the next project. They run out of money and time and the collection goes into a little bit of disrepair. And so the archeologist, the professor, the whoever says, oh, this will be my retirement project. That's what happened to my thesis collection. The, one of the archeologists that worked on that said, do this when I have time, when I'm retired. Uh, that is, I think the most, some of the most um, common for how legacy collections kind of come about. So it's a quick overview of legacy collections. I have two examples today. Um, that's the basis of a lot of the work that I've done, uh, both in New Hampshire and in New Mexico as well, um, and a little bit kind of here and there. I've done a lot of really weird work. Um, so a little bit of my background. Here I am, if you have my video up. I'm in the Plymouth State University uh, lab right now. We have a lot of boxes. We have some boxes with uh, the Archaeological Society Library, and we have some pig skulls over here that I did in undergrad. So I worked in the Plymouth State University lab as an undergraduate student. Um, I worked with Dr. Starbuck, uh, Dr. David Starbuck, since 2013, um, and is one of the reasons I'm a lab person now. I far consider myself more of a lab person than a field person. Um, so I've worked here, worked on sites from New York State, also have worked with the material that we store at Plymouth State that the state technically owns. Well, no not technically, we're storing it for the state and some other collections too, that I've, I've used as a teacher and have really benefited from as a student. Um, we also had, when we started our, when Plymouth State started our work with Enfield, that's the picture of me in the ground in the corner. When we started our work with Enfield, the Enfield Shaker Museum in 2015, they said, this is one of those examples of a legacy collection that I'll talk about later. They said, hey, we have all of these materials that we dug up in 1989 from a kind of salvage project that we haven't had an archeologist fully look at them. They're in storage. Uh, they haven't been cleaned, which is to no fault of the, you know, to the museum. It's just, you kind of sometimes need a trained eye and the time and the care that it takes to, to handle these collections. It's a lot of work. Legacy collections are a ton of work and a ton of labor. Um, so we started off with working on the 1989 uh, collection and worked with that kind of in step um, with the 2015 stuff. Some of the kind of first years we were, I think 2015, some of the first years we were working with Enfield. We're continuing our work with Enfield um, with the university. I'm teaching the field school in June. I'm so excited. Um, and then my master's work was also in legacy collections, a little bit of a windy trail there. Um, that's a picture of me doing some CRM work at some rock shelters. It was really cold and I was the TA, so I got to escape from the wind for a little bit. Um, and then just to mention briefly in Nicaragua, the um, government had given us uh, collection, going faster than I thought. Slow me down if you need me to slow down. Um, in Nicaragua, the government had asked us to help clear out some, a site that had been uh, damaged by uh, rainwater, by flood water and some other damage um, and had given us, given our project, a teaching collection that was pretty unprovenienced. It was in a languishing in a storage room for decades. Um, so we took it, I, that's where I learned how to reconstruct ceramics. That was the first time I'd reconstructed ceramics was in Nicaragua. Um, and some of, some of these experiences were my first times, certainly in, at the Enfield collection and in Nicaragua were my first times working with legacy collections. Um, so I really owe it to my time at Plymouth as an undergrad and I'm really happy to be teaching here again. Um, where I worked with these kinds of collections. Um, I worked with collections that had not just come out of the ground. Uh, and I really, really love it. I love working in the lab. It's my favorite place. Um, it's where I think we find all of the cool stuff. And we find all, we clean all of the dirty stuff that other people have thought weren't important. So I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start a little bit backwards in time. Um, I'm gonna start, Actually, I'm starting kind of most recent to backwards. So for my thesis work um, and the research I had done in New Mexico, uh, I didn't, 
because partially of my experience is working with legacy collections in undergrad, I didn't really want to excavate my own materials. Um, I didn't really want to focus on a certain material. In undergrad, I had done my uh, capstone seminar paper on ceramic analysis, and I kind of wanted to become more of a generalized lab person. Um, I really love the generalized lab work. I love working with a ton of different material types. Um, so I was given the Paraje San Diego collection as see what you can do with this. Um, so Paraje San Diego is the name of the site. Um, it's a campsite along the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, the travel route from Mexico, from present day Mexico City, from Teotihuacan area, um, up to uh, Okeowinge, uh, Pueblo Okeowinge, or present day, around present day Santa Fe. Um, so it was this really, really long trade route, and Paraje means campsite. So our campsite was right before um, the Jornada de Muerto, or this really long stretch of desert where Paraje San Diego, when people were traveling north, was the last place for them to kind of gather materials, water their uh, uh, pack mules, things like that, their horses. Um, it was also used in prehistory by um, Comanche and Mescalero Apache, Apache communities um, going, you know, their traditional um, roots. Uh, but we were really focused on the Spanish colonial aspect, kind of Spanish colonial to um, U.S. Civil War until this trade route, this pathway kind of died down when the railroads came in in um, the 19. 20s and 30s um, as New Mexico is becoming a state. So that's a little bit of the background on the site itself. Um, as far as the archaeology on the site goes, it was first excavated in 1994 by Dr. Edward Stasky with New Mexico State University. Uh, this became his retirement project that I then inherited. I apparently love inheriting projects from uh, people. It happened in undergrad. It, it's just my lot. Um, and then it, it was resurveyed in 2015 and 2017 by my advisor, Dr. Kelly Jenks. Um, it's now part of the National Register of Historic Places um, as part of the Camino Real going through from El Paso to Santa Fe. Um, so I was really glad to be working on this material. Um, in 1994, we had, I'll go through some of what we had in a second, but we had all the artifacts um, we did not have all of the data. Uh, we didn't have a lot of the dig records. Um, we had, again, all the artifacts. The artifacts had been preliminarily identified. Um, the glass was just generally placed into, um, you know, if, if you had, uh, I think there are some non-archeologists in the crowd. So I'm gonna use my water bottle actually as, a, as an example, if you have my video up. So we had some like tops of glass bottles and body frags and base frags all in the same bags, all in the same kind of, um, not provenience, but all in the same identify identification area. And what we wanted was all of the, you know, if we had, um, for example, um, like regular brown glass, if we had, you know, all of the regular brown glass kind of uh, bottle finishes in the same bag, all of the body finishes in the same bag and all the base in the same bag, in the same bag, all of the base frags in the same bag. So you can just say, oh, I'm specifically wanting to look at the lip finishes or the, the kind of tops of the glass bottles. You can just pull that bag out and you have all of it. That was the goal. Uh, they also had incom incomplete proveniences. Um, it was old data, right? So this was, you know, I was born in 1995, I'll, I'll date myself. Um, so this was, you know, 20, uh, when I was working on it, 24 years, you know, earlier. Um, different technology had been used um, to map the site. Um, different technology had been used in general. Uh, this is a view looking north. So we're looking kind of towards Santa Fe, toward Okeowinge um, of the Camino Real, which is amazing. There have been um, full, uh, aerial photography of a lot of the Camino Real through New Mexico um, and part of parts of the southern parts of Mexico. So you can still see kind of ancient pathways as it was used pretty heavily 
from the 1500s until, well, and before that, kind of probably 12, 1300s until the 1920s or 30s. Um, so you can still see the pathway. Um, it's pretty bland desert landscape. Uh, I visited a couple of times. Uh, so this is the campsite we're standing on the, the Camino Real, the Royal Road of the Interior is what that means in Spanish, um, at the campsite. So what did I have for data? I, my purpose for this research, having a legacy collection, having a collection that, you know, wasn't very useful because artifacts weren't fully identified. The ceramic was fully identified and the, um, some of the stone was and some of the ammunition was. But really we didn't have a full, full idea of the extent of artifact dates or necessarily number of ammunition um, that I don't think I have slides about, but I'll mention the ammunition in a second. Um, we wanted to get it so we could combine, we could also combine data from 2015 and 2017 to 1994. Um, so we had an original 1994 base grid map. We had like, this is originally a printed photo. This is a photo that was taken in 94. Um, I, I really like this photo. Um, we also had photo slides, um, you know, the old fashioned, the old fashioned photo slides. I got laughed at at the SAAs when I called them old fashioned. Um, and then we also had data on floppy disks. Um, we had collection plot maps that were on those floppy disks and printed out. It was a lot of, a lot of scattered data. Uh, we had all the artifacts, mostly. Some of them had become teaching, part of the teaching collection at the museum. But I had re-identified um, especially the 152 metal artifacts and the 485 class artifacts. That's how I spent my Thanksgiving break one year in grad school. And then the ceramic shirts had been identified by a ceramics expert um, with uh, Inha in Mexico. And then the stone artifacts had been also um, identified previously. But really it was the metal and glass. I'm trained mostly as a historic archeologist. I've done prehistory, prehistoric uh, stuff through CRM and through working in graduate school in New Mexico kind of impossible to escape prehistoric archaeology in New Mexico. Um, and, and now since being back in New Hampshire, I've done a lot more with prehistoric or pre-contact um, stuff. So this was the data that I had that I was working with. Um, and none of the original 1994 maps had been brought into, we didn't have any digital um, copies of those except the ones that were on floppy disks. Um, which had its own problems. That's, I ended up having to go to TDAR, or the Digital Archaeological Record. Um, that's when I did a lot of that digitization. Um, so I wanted to bring all of the data that was, um, that was physical, all of the physical data, all of the maps, into a GIS format. And something with legacy collections you have to keep in mind is that not you know, GIS is, is the thing now, uh, geographic info systems, the kind of maps that I'll show in a second, that's the technology we're using now. In 20 years, maybe that's not the kind of information, the same information we'll be using. So that's also something I had to keep in mind. Um, I kept everything in as stable form, as stable digital forms as I could, things like PDF format. Um, but it's it's difficult, right? Saving that metadata, the kind of the data behind the data can be a, can be a tricky process sometimes in legacy collection work. Um, I really loved working with the artifacts of this collection, um, Spanish colonial for the most part, um, and early American kind of um, early American Civil War, not early American, early Western Southwestern American, where where not quite at the 1700s American in New Mexico. Started off with Spanish colonization. Um, so that's what I had to work with. Um, oh, I got ahead of myself. Of course I did. So methods for management and curation. I wanted to create a full catalog for the 1994 collection. Um, I had new catalog numbers, right? So I made new catalog, some new catalog numbers for each of the different, I'm holding up my water bottle again each of the different parts of kind of, especially the glass bottles, 
um, some of the some of the metal got you know additional um, notes added to them because the original the original identification was preliminary. Um, they didn't have, especially for glass and metal, historic artifacts are woefully underutilized in New Mexico. I don't know why. Um, in my opinion, anyway. Could be wrong. I think it's changing. Uh, so I recorded both of the original catalog numbers and added some new ones to really fill out the information. Um, the kind of attributes I recorded, um, some general provenience that I knew from the site, um, they excavated, they surveyed in 50 by 50 squares, which is not super specific, but I had those grid squares, uh, certainly by material type and description, including artifact form, if it was um, a bullet fragment or we had a lot of can fragments and some can fragments with bullet holes in them. Um, specifically, uh, you know, what kind of, glass bottle we were looking at, what kind of metal can we were looking at, um, and what year it came from, right? Because glass and metal can be dated to pretty specific time periods if you know what you're looking for. Um, again, looking at my water bottle, sorry. Um, we also had count, um, and we had some preliminary weights that I didn't reweigh anything. Weight is uh, was an important thing. Um, I didn't, for my thesis, I didn't agree with having to weigh every single artifact type, um, but it can be important, right, if you're thinking about how much of a glass bottle stays. I happen to bring a water bottle that kind of looks like a glass bottle. Um, if you're looking at how many base frags you have, sometimes it's more useful to weigh the base fragments um, instead of trying to count them all out, or the body fragments instead of trying to count them all out. And it's the same with bone. We actually didn't have any bone from this collection, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, it had been published on a couple of different times um, since 1994, but not many. Um, or it had been used in supplement to the research that was done in 2015 and 2017. Um, I digitized the physical collections um, and they're being stored mostly um, at TDAR or the Digital Archaeological Record. A really, really great resource. I broke their system a little bit. Um, the digital archaeological record is based in Phoenix, ooh, it just felt, no, Tempe. They're based in Tempe, Arizona, um, I'm near Phoenix. Uh, I, as part of my thesis, I interned there for a semester. Instead of doing excavation, I did digital curation. Um, they focus a lot on digitizing. They work with the Society for American Archaeology to digitize all of kind of a lot of the paper abstracts from yearly meetings. Um, they do a lot of CRM reports. That's really what, you know, uh, digitizing all of the gray matter, the gray literature that archaeology in inevitably creates, right? CRM reports that get, um, submitted to the state, but not always published, or submitted to a company, but not always published, things like that. Um, yeah, I did just say gray literature, and as I said it, it, you know, gray literature is something that um, happens in government reports too, um, government reports that kind of go in, that aren't fully published through a publication, um, but are, are more loosely, made available. So TDAR makes those more available. Um, they're great. Um, and so through kind of trying to archive my collection, I really ran into some issues with their, their not issues, but they knew they were weaknesses. We were working it out because um, they want to start digitizing more complete collections, more complete artifact collections. So it was really a uh, an exercise in patience a lot of the time, but we, we did a lot of it. And they helped me uh, get the information out of the floppy disks and also scan in some of those uh, photo slides. I was actually pretty familiar with the photo slide process. I actually done some of that for uh, Dr. Starbuck when I was a student. So fully aware of the, of the process it takes to digitize some of those photo slides. Um, the really important part for the archeologists like Dr. Jenks who was working on kind of the, the um, nomination process for the site 
we wanted to bring the 1994 data and merge it into an updated format and combine it with, merge it with the 2015 and 2017 data from uh, Dr. James um, to, to, to more, you know, tell a more complete story of the site instead of this, oh, there was some stuff that happened in 1994, but we, we don't have the GIS for it because it wasn't in 1994 mapped using a GPS, you know, handheld GPS. Um, it was mapped, I believe, using a theodolite, which is some older technology, not quite outdated, but certainly older than your handheld GPS system. And that is the, the kind of gold standard today. Um, so here's some of the maps that I made. I'm doing okay on time. I'm trying to keep an eye on it. Here's some of the maps I made with the 2017, the new 2017 site boundary, um, plus the 19, the original 1994 grid. So that small grid you see kind of in the center is what was surveyed, not really excavated, mostly we're in New Mexico at this point. A lot of a lot of the archaeology that happens is not meter deep excavations. A lot of it is surface collection. Easiest archaeology I've ever done on the desert, no rain, dusty desert. Some of the easiest archaeology I've done. Um, so that's what that center is. That's that original 1994 grid, with those little boxes. And then what's around it is the site was expanded in 2017. Um, here are images of all of the artifacts that were found in 1994. Again, we are on, oh, I guess it's not quite 50. It, sorry, I'm trying to now remember what the original grid square was. Might have been 25 meters. 25 meter grid squares also sounds right. I'm also looking at trying to measure in my brain. And so these are all of the grid squares. We couldn't get any closer. The goal in archaeology, or at least what I tell my students, the goal in archaeology is to try and kind of replace any artifact you found in three-dimensional space. So if you find an artifact, take it out, analyze it, some, and someone asks you down the line, where did that come from? You should be able to be able to put it back into physical space, into kind of three-dimensional space, especially three-dimensional if you're working on a deep excavation. So we weren't able to get super um, in-depth uh, spatial data, but there are some interesting conclusions that I was able to draw from looking at the 1994 material. Um, we can see a lot of material kind of going perpendicular to the Camino Real is what, uh, no, the Camino Real goes through the center of the site. Sorry, this is a modern road in the top, uh, and kind of what what is that northeast corner, top right corner. So what we see is a lot of artifact concentration actually right at the um, right in the middle of the Camino Real, um, with a drop off of artifacts when you get to kind of the the kind of uh, east and west of the of the original road. Um, interesting in a couple of ways. You can also, the ceramic distribution's weird. There's kind of glass and metal everywhere. That could be because especially glass breaks a little bit differently, a little bit easier than some ceramic does. Um, I also broke the ceramic down, ceramics person in a lot of ways. So I broke the ceramics down by what was coming in from Okeowinge, what was coming in from Mexico um, or present day Mexico, and then what was coming in what was like locally, what was indigenously made um, by you know people in the area. So those are all the all the major artifact types. Um, I left. What did I leave off of here? Oh, I left um, flaked stone off of here. Um, my thesis was only focused on the historical artifacts, um, so I left the I left some of the flaked stone off of here. I also created a feature map. Um, we didn't, this was um, based off of the original hand-drawn, hand-drafted um, map that we had had. So now it was digitized um, thanks to my work. Uh, it was certainly difficult. I used ArcGIS for all of this. Um, we had thankfully um, found the original datum point, or not we, Dr. Jenks, uh, in resurveying, it actually found the original data point that Dr. Stasky had left in 1994. 
thankfully. Um, we had had the geographic location, but we were able to, we, Dr. Jenks Kelly was able to refine it in 2015. So I was really able to get a good picture of what was kind of, what was where on the site. Um, so what you're seeing here, we had, they had excavation units um, at certain intervals. They had large trenches. There were also a handful of excavation units near and around features. Um, and the features include mostly, um, they include mostly um, uh, hearths, old fireplaces, um, or charcoal as well. Charcoal, like little, little spots of charcoal because we were trying to look for human human kind of occupation at the site. Again, it's a paraje, it's a campsite. People would camp here for a couple of days before continuing on either north or south on the paraje. Here's some of the artifacts. Here's some of the glass artifacts. I think I only include, I love glass and ceramic. They're my, I have a weakness. Um, so the only full glass bottle we found was a 18, or it found in 1994, 1860s, beautiful full complete whiskey bottle. Um, we were also able, what I was able to find, um, I can't not include a full picture of a whiskey bottle, I can't not, but what I was able to, to find in going through and creating an entire artifact catalog was um, glass that was embossed with Empire Glass Company, El Paso, Texas. Um, so that was the Empire Glass Company um, worked in, out of El Paso, again, we're in kind of uh, 40, 45 minutes north of Las Cruces, so probably almost two hours away from El Paso at this point, but it was the 1920s. People had cars, they were drinking, you know, it used to be an old automobile road, makes a little bit of sense. Um, also, this property was used for ranching on and off, so interesting to find El Paso, Texas em uh, embossed on some glass uh, found at the site. And a lot of it too. Uh, I was also able to identify worked glass, um, probably used as scrapers. Um, there's a site, I mean, contact period sites in general, both in New Hampshire and in New Mexico, you sometimes find brass arrowheads. That happens pretty frequently. Worked glass also happens. Glass doesn't um, kind of chip nearly as well as things like obsidian, which we find in New Mexico. But worked glass is certainly interesting. You can see it the best on, I think on this top one, but these also had some, some working. So all of the worked edges are on the top from your perspective. So all of the worked edges are all, all here. Um, we found, I think seven pieces of worked glass. These are just kind of the best pictures of that worked glass. Um, that was a really great find. Um, not quite sure what the worked glass means. Probably um, contact, you know, uh, the Apache um, would lead Spanish uh, missionaries, sometimes as guides through um, the Camino Real, um, used through, you know, antiquity until um, the 1920s. Worked glass isn't that rare to find, but it's something that we didn't know, you know, the 1994 collection, I looked at it again in 2018, we didn't know there was worked glass. I remember pulling it out of the bag and, and looking at it and looking at it and looking at it, and then finally asking someone who does flint napping, because anyone in the hallway pretty much at the, uh, uh, down the hall from the historical lab, I was like, please, I need, I know what I'm looking at, but I need a second pair of eyes and we, we figured out that there were about seven or eight pieces of worked glass, not a ton, but enough to certainly, you know, be interesting. Um, also, before I get to, I'm almost done, um, ish. Uh, I was also able to find that the most, uh, the most frequent type of ammunition was actually Winchester, which is interesting because Winchester is known as the gun that won the West. Um, so the fact that we were able to say there are many, many more um, Winchester ammunition frags than um, uh, many more uh, Winchester ammunition frags than anything else. Um, I'm going to answer uh, Dick's question in the chat because it's about the glass. There were a couple of glass frags with... Um, oh, no, I'm forgetting the terminology and that's embarrassing. Um, with with seams. So there were seams on some of the glass. You can a little bit see it in this picture. 
So, you know, uh, we're not talking hand blown glass here. It was definitely machine made. That's the term I'm looking for. It was definitely machine made glass. Um, so certainly towards the end of the lifespan of the Camino Real, um, which is also interesting, right? We kind of maybe expect the, the worked glass to be a little bit earlier. But from that, we can see there's a lot more interaction between people who knew how to work stone that could work glass and also maybe even some of the American occupation of the site. That's a really good question. Um, there are other people who have done work on the worked glass since um, I just originally identified it. Um, but there were some seams or some things that I thought were seams on some of them. It's all, it was all aqua glass, which is also interesting. All of the worked glass was aqua. And none of it was like the dark whiskey bottle glass, which is also interesting for a number of reasons. Um, and I'll talk about the field school again um, in the Enfield field school in a second. I don't have a lot more to say um, about the, I can't tell, I'm answering Dick's question again. I couldn't determine, no one, none of us could determine it if it was from the same vessel. It was too far chipped and broken. Um, but it's quite possible that, you know, someone broke, oh, we're done this bottle, let's break it and use it for something else. That's a possibility. Um, it could also be just as possible that it was coming from, you know, different vessels. I have less information um, on, I don't, I have less pictures from the Enfield collection for a couple of reasons. Um, the artifacts weren't recovered from a regular art um, excavation like the Paraje San Diego stuff was. Um, the artifacts were recovered um, from a backhoe ditch. Is there anyone from Enfield here? Uh, Carolyn Smith helped me out with a lot of this information. She was part of this. So Enfield, the museum itself is, the Shaker Village originally was from, this is the Great Stone Dwelling, all the way to probably mm, a thousand feet from the Great Stone Dwelling to the lakeside. But all of this is now, some of this is now private property. This is a private house. This is also a private company. So there was a, there was a backhoe that was, I think, creating a new water line that had hit um, uh, artifacts, that had hit a whole slew of, of very distinctly shaker artifacts. So there were several people working at the museum at the time that said, hey, 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 let's not like, can we please just have 24 hours to take all this material out. It belongs, it, it should be at the museum. It belongs in the museum. So they were able to, um, so unlike in the Prahi San Diego, we know kind of exactly where that ditch was, um, but now it's on private property and um, some gravel, gravel road stuff. So no extra photos or related materials are included in this collection, which makes it interesting, um, differently interesting than some other collections. We have uh, full glass medicine bottles, again, embossed saying shaker medicine, shaker fluid, shaker and field shaker, things like that. Um, and reconstructable table ceramics, uh, as well as some metal artifacts. I haven't taken a peek at this collection. I got wrapped up in planning for June. So I wasn't able to take a peek at the, the artifacts recently, but this was the, actually, I think I worked on the 1989 stuff before the 2015 stuff came in, which is interesting. I've been now working at Enfield for, for a while. Um, so the, the 89 collection's really interesting. Um, uh, and I would love, this is one of those projects, I have a couple of projects in New Hampshire that I'd love to look more into. Um, the, this collection has been entirely identified, which is one of the reasons why I don't have a ton on it. We finished uh, cleaning and washing the collection and identifying it pretty soon after we got a hold of it. We had a ton of people working in the lab. And it's one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of. And it also helped us recognize what we had then found, um, especially at the boy shop, which is, where's my cursor? There it is, which was now right here. Actually, it was behind here um, in 2017. So it kind of gave us a clue of what we were looking for, um, certainly in regards to the table ceramics. Um, I would love to get my hands back on the Enfield collection and take some really nice artifact photos of it. Um, but that's some of the Enfield collection. 
So what can we learn from these kinds of legacy collections? Um, I personally working on a legacy collection in grad school was not um, always well received um, by some of my peers. Uh, certainly in, in, again, in my experience in grad school and then looking at PhD work, uh, students, archeology span students are really encouraged to excavate their own material, to lead a field school, to, to always get that new, that new discovery out of the ground. But I think working with legacy collections has really taught me that you can learn a lot from things that were excavated 20 or 30 years ago, or even 10 years ago, um, and really not treating archeology span and excavations as, as distinct units right, like in Enfield, not treating 1989 any differently than the 2015 to now, things 2015 to 2021, I guess, that we have collected using all of the knowledge that we have now. Um, I think PhD students and master's students should be really encouraged to work on these kinds of collections. Um, and also funding that um, kind of that management too is really important in in the ethical concerns of collections in the and the curation crisis that archaeology labs and storage repositories are facing. Um, I also believe that excavation and archaeology is far more emphasized uh, than lab work and that might just be my own experience. Um, but I think it's largely true. Um, working with uh, students in the field, I don't think they necessarily get a lot of hands on work in the lab. Um, and something I'm emphasizing, really, really emphasizing um, at uh, Enfield, hopefully. Um, so that is, I think I might, there's a question for me in the chat um, that before I get to my thank yous, I will address Dick's question. And I suppose go back to some, pick some fun pictures. So uh, asked me specifically, um, what, were, what was I able to add to knowledge of the Camino Real site that was not apparent prior to your analysis, which is a really good question. Um, through, in 2015 and 2017, no further artifacts were collected. Uh, Dr. Jenks knew we had this collection. She just didn't, you know, had other, had other priorities because of pressure from, university and other things and and she just needed the the extra hands working on the 94 collection. So we were really able to to prove that um, you know the scientific process in archaeology is all about you know redoing you know refinding and redoing not necessarily excavations but certainly retooling the dates of occupation. So through finding artifacts, like um, some of the ammunition, dating the ammunition, finding um, probably really early, well, I say probably, I said probably Spanish, really early um, musket balls and through dating, through clearly dating um, some of the glass artifacts, we're able to pretty distinctly say, yes, this, this um, site was definitely used during the most during these time periods and more ceramics, one of the things that we found at the site, more ceramics were coming from Mexico up north to Santa Fe than the other way around. Um, probably for a couple of different reasons, uh, certainly places further south were more, in Spanish colonial period, were more, um, uh, um, were more settled, more colonized, and then the Spanish were still trying to gain control over New Mexico. So things were far more going north than going south. We were able to prove things like that. Um, I was able to, again, find, you know, find more, more data backing up um, previous research questions. Um, and while I didn't come across any groundbreaking um, you know, think groundbreaking uh, artifacts. There are many, you know, you see stories of lab tech found um, carved bone in an old Neanderthal collection. I see stories like that pretty frequently that really um, uh, reinforce the idea that, um, uh, that archeology span collections should be revisited every now and then. 
um, that legacy collections should be revisited, that should be re-identified. We know a lot more now than about, you know, artifacts. There are different eyes, there are different people trained on different artifact types now than were working in the 1990s, or certainly in Enfield in 1989, there were no archeologists who were helping out. They did a fantastic job rescuing those artifacts, but they didn't have any lab techs to identify things. So then working on legacy collections, we're able to re-identify, retool, come back with new information. Um, and that's really impressive. Um, legacy collections are also great use for, um, um, teaching collections as well as teaching tools. Um, I think there are some questions maybe, but I really wanna uh, have uh, a couple of thank yous. Uh, to the New Hampshire Archaeological Society for letting me talk today, letting me jabber on today. Uh, New Mexico State University for um, supporting my master's research. Plymouth State University for everything that they've done for me as an undergraduate and a teaching lecturer. I really love this university. This is This lab is, has been my second and third homes through the years. Uh, the Enfield Shaker Museum for doing all they do um, and also letting me have their field school. And I really, really, and I'm not gonna get choked up, uh, really also want to um, mention uh, Dr. Starbuck in this too, and I'm not gonna get choked up. Um, he was my first archeology span professor and his presence is surely missed these days. Um, yeah, I see something in the chat that I'm going to breathe. Um, question again in the chat, is there a collection that I really want to study? Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for this so now you can see my tear addled eyes. Um, so because I'm in this lab pretty frequently, um, I've been talking to Mark uh, Dobrolaski about a couple of the archaeology collections, haven't gotten back to him on those, but um, since Dr. Starbuck had retired and then more recently um, passed away, I've kind of inherited the archaeology lab and the collections here. Um, and I would love, love, love more than anything to revisit some of the Sewell's Falls artifacts that we have at the university um, a lot. Uh, also, some of the beautiful um, uh, uh, Governor Wentworth stuff that we have here, too. Um, we also have First Fort. We have some of the first fort artifacts. We have a, a bunch of random stuff. Um, I really, I love New Hampshire archaeology, but I think Sewell's Falls is at the top of that list for me right now. I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> there is a question in the chat, Hannah. Um, could you tell us about the field school you mentioned uh, in yes. June? Yes. Um, so this will go, this will be the eighth, eighth? seventh, eighth year that we're doing a field school at the Enfield Shaker Museum. Um, we welcome volunteers. Um, if you're also interested, you can take the class for Plymouth State credit. Um, you know, if anyone wants to work CRM, we're an accredited field school. Uh, we'll be digging in front of the uh, Brethren shops. Um, they want to build a French drain, so we're going to be doing some archaeology there. We're running from June 1st to the 24th. Um, uh, in two week kind of intervals. So you can either volunteer for the whole time or just one of the two week sessions. Feel free to email, I can leave my email in the chat because it'll be a little bit easier than have everyone having to write it down. Um, I don't mind leaving that in the chat. Um, so you can email me with any questions if you wanna volunteer. Um, it'll be from I think 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day. Um, it's a really great time. I'm really excited. I've been to Enfield Shake Village. It's a great place. It's beautiful. Yes. Yeah, I agree. We do have another question in the uh, chat. Um, somebody says, I love this idea of uh, revisitation over time, uh, legacy inheritance. Uh, the question is, do folks study legacy collections to study the practices of archaeology? And then along with that, like history or his historiography, I think. Thank is how you that's... for saying that for me, <laughs> or archaeology. <Yeah. laughs> it's an interesting question. Thank you, Liz, who is a professor of English at Plymouth. <laughs> um, um, do we study archaeology collections too? I suppose there's there can be fragments of understanding 
how archaeology was done, especially in kind of pre, especially if you think about older, older collections, like pre probably 1950s or 60s. Um, but there, it's, it's interesting because when you're working on legacy collections, especially updating um, or changing, kind of refitting um, catalog numbers, there's an interesting um, thing, things that happen when you say, oh, they made these uh, choices in um, identifying artifacts. Oh, they, they identified this as a different thing. Maybe that's actually, you know, there, there's, there's some sort of, of compromise that has to happen between working on older collections and then updating those, right? Like combining, keeping as much original data as possible, but also realizing that some of that data is, is not as useful um, to present day and possibly future archeologists, but that original data, those original catalog numbers, the original, sometimes the original labels are super duper important. And sometimes those original labels archaeology sites are at least 50 years old, like that 50 years rule, sometimes those original, that original data becomes its own kind of archive, that its own kind of uh, data set. Um, in the phrasing that they use, um, in sometimes the, the, the politically incorrect phrasing that museums have used in the past. So certainly there's a lot of, um, certainly there's a lot of identification and choices that are made when working on, especially, you know, 1950s before collections. So um, Liz also said, yes, the older stuff was what she was especially imagining. Yeah. Um, and she said, I'm learning and thinking about so much and finding this utterly fascinating as a rank amateur. Thank you so much, Hannah. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Um, so I think that that is the end of our questions, Hannah. Um, mm -hmm. I really, I wanna thank you so much for bringing this. Uh, this is a, it seems like a very, very important part of archeology. span And so thank you so much.